Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the 34th webinar in the Rus Copernicus series. My name is Teresa Roth, and I will be guiding you through this session today. We will look at the stamp to stamps workflow and use it to prepare Sentinel-1 SLC time series for the ingestion to stamps permanent scatter interferometric processing. First, let's have a look at the outline of today's session. We will start with the introduction to RUS service and its recent updates. Then we will move on to the introduction to snap to stamps then the study area and data used for this exercise, and finally Sentinel-1, which is the sensor that we will be using. Afterwards, we will finally move to the RUS virtual machine for the exercise practical session, and the webinar will be concluded by a Q&A session at the end, which will last for approximately 30 minutes. The entire webinar is being recorded and will be available soon on YouTube and also on the rustraining.eu where you can also find, in addition to the video, a Q&A session summary, as the Q&A is not being recorded. Now for the introduction to RUS service. As you may already know, RUS stands for Research and User Support for Sentinel Core Products, and it is a project funded by the European Commission and managed by the European Space Agency. Its main aim is to provide free and open scalable platform in the form of virtual machines, pre-installed with open source toolboxes, such as, for example, SNAP, QGIS, and development environments such as R or Python, and many others. In addition to the virtual machine, RUS also provides a specialized remote sensing help desk, which can help you with any queries regarding which data to use, for what application, and so on. And last but not least, we also engage in many training activities, such as, for example, this webinar. Now let's move on to some recent updates. As of September 2020, the RUS project is running in version 2.0, which includes some updates to the service. From now on, the support will be provided in two categories. The first category are the training activities, where we will continue to provide support to face-to-face -face trainings and virtual classrooms, then webinars and support to webinar replay, and finally, support to external training organization and operation. The second category are individual users and R&D projects. Now let's look at each category more in detail. For all the training activities, RUS virtual machines will still be provided to users as it has been in the past. Each face-to-face -face event will consist of approximately 20 participants with each participant provided with a virtual machine to be able to repeat the exercise in real time. The type of the virtual machine will be dependent, as always, on the specific training needs of the particular session, and the VMs are available for one week with the possibility of extension of up to a month, and the ICT and EOS expert support will be also available to the participants for the duration of the VM. The monthly webinar sessions and associated PDF tutorials will also continue to be available to everybody, via the RUS Copernicus portal and the RUS training portal. A limited number of VMs will be available for webinar replay for the maximum duration of two weeks. Finally, the support for externally organized trainings will be for maximum of 30 VMs and the participants will benefit also from the support of the ICT team. Moving on to the individual users and R&D projects. While the standard RUS VMs as provided in the previous session of the RUS project will unfortunately be no longer available for individual and R&D projects, RUS Copernicus will still provide support to individual projects through a new solution with Docker container image containing a complete RUS virtual environment and all its tools, which will be provided upon request. The container can then be deployed on the user's own infrastructure, which can be cloud-based either in-house or acquired from a commercial provider, but it can also be deployed on a laptop or PC. The ICT team will be available to guide users through the deployment procedure, and you can learn more about Docker on the web page mentioned above. Finally, as you may already know, RUS service is based on two portals. The first portal is where you can request either a virtual machine or the Docker container, and you can also find all the information about the RUS service there. 
and then you can go to the restraining portal where you can find the information about restrainings, webinars, face-to-face -face events, and so on. And you can also apply to participate. Moreover, you can also register for our e-learning platform there. Finally, the RUS service also has a YouTube channel where you can find the latest videos and recordings of the webinars. Now let's move on to the introduction to the topic. So first, a few words about the persistence scatter interferometry. It is an advanced differential interferometric method, and it requires a large number of SAR scenes acquired over the same area. Typically, a minimum of 15 to 20 images is needed to perform a C-band PSI analysis. It is possible to use shorter data sets with X-band PSI due to higher resolution and shorter wavelength, for example. However, for example, for Sentinel-1, generally larger numbers of images are desirable. PSI is also so-called opportunistic method, which means that it is only possible if enough permanent scatterers are available in the study area. The PS density is usually low in vegetated, forested, and low reflectivity areas, for example, such as very smooth surfaces, and in steep terrains facing the radar sensor. Snow coverage, construction work, street repavement, and so on can cause complete or partial loss of permanent scatterers. By contrast, permanent scatterers are usually abundant on buildings, monuments, antennas, poles, conducts, and exposed rocks or outcrops, among others. The lack of permanent scatterers or low PS density over a given area can be mitigated by deploying various advanced methods, one of which is, for example, the method proposed by Andrew Hooper and others, which uses a novel PS selection using phase characteristics, which is suitable to find low amplitude natural targets with phase stability that cannot be identified by amplitude based algorithms. This method is implemented in the Stanford Method for Persistent Scatterers, or STAMS, which is the tool that we are in this exercise aiming to prepare our data for. So the STAMS is a software package that implements an INSAR persistent scatterer method, as well as small baselines method. And as I've mentioned, it's developed to work even in terrains devoid of man-made structures and or undergoing a non-steady deformation. Note that even though STAMPS is more or less open source, it is partly written in MATLAB and uses some built-in MATLAB functions, and therefore MATLAB license is necessary to run the processing. That said, it is still one of the most cost-efficient softwares out there to perform PSI, since commercial software is generally even more expensive. As mentioned in the beginning of this presentation, in this exercise and this training, we will not go into STAMPS processing. We will only look at the data preparation, since STAMPS is not a full-fledged SAR processing software, and it does not include tools, for example, for interferogram generation, and we do need to use a different software to pre-process the data before we could start the STAMPS processing. The data preparation for ingestion to STAMPS is quite demanding and requires many steps with large data sets. As of 2018, the SNAP Sentinel-1 toolbox also offers interferogram generation compatible with STAMPS for PSI processing. The SNAP to STAMPS is a Python workflow that has been developed by Jose Manuel Delgado Blasco and Mikhail Fumelis in collaboration with Professor Andrew Hooper, and it automates the pre-processing of Sentinel-1 SLC data and their preparation for ingestion to STAMPS. And as I mentioned already, it is based on the ESA Sentinel application platform, or SNAP, and the Sentinel-1 toolbox. The only requirements for running the tool is to have SNAP and Sentinel-1 toolbox installed. The SNAP to STAMPS workflow is compatible with version 6, and for version 7 and 8, there are some incompatibilities, but they can be overcome. Furthermore, it is also necessary to have Python 2.7 installed, as the tool, again, is incompatible with new versions of Python. And several specific Python modules are also necessary, as you see in the list. There is no specific hardware requirements, but note that Sentinel-1 data are quite large, and their processing requires significant resources. For example, the interferogram generation step, which is the most computationally demanding, will likely require a machine with minimum of 16 gigabyte of RAM. 
With more resources available, the processing will of course run faster. However, with less resources, you might face possible failures. Now here are some additional sources where you can learn more about the PSI processing. For software, please have a look at the Snap to Stamps menu, the Stamps menu, and then you can also download the Stamps and st Snap to Stamps software. Then for the PSI resources, of course, you can find a lot of information online, but I would recommend you to read the Persistent Scatter Interferometry Review by Crosetto et al. from 2016, at least. Then you can also find some tutorials. To name just few, you can have a look at the GIS blog by Matthias Schögel on using stamps for PSI analysis. It is a post series and it is very comprehensive. Then you can also have a look at an exercise done by Professor Andrew Hooper for the ESA land training course in 2015. Now to the study area and data. As for our differential INSAR exercise from 2018, we will also look at Mexico City in this session. The city with its extreme subsidence is an ideal study case and it has grown from 78 kilometers square to a metropolis about 100 times larger. In order to provide water for its growing population, the groundwater extraction has increased, with many adverse effects causing some parts of the Mexico City to sink by more than 9 meters since the beginning of the 20th century. Currently, the studies show some parts of Mexico City are sinking about 30 centimeters per year as a result of the aquifer not being able to replenish by water enough to support the ground above. For this exercise, we will use data from the Sentinel-1, which is specially optimized for differential INSAR processing due to its stringent orbit control and small perpendicular baselines. We will use 31 images acquired from November 1st, 2019, to November 1st of 2020 in 12-day intervals. Finally, let's move on to the introduction to Sentinel-1. The Sentinel-1 is part of the Sentinels family, which is a family of satellites built by the European Space Agency for the needs of the EU, EU Copernicus program. Copernicus is the largest Earth observation program in the world, and all its satellite data are available under free and open policy to everyone. Once completed, this program will be formed by six constellations of two satellites each with a range of technologies from SAR to multispectral imaging. Sentinel-1 is a satellite constellation which is formed by two identical satellites, A and B, which are placed in the same orbit 180 degrees apart. The constellation carries identical active C-band SAR sensor and allows a repeat frequency of six days over Europe, Mediterranean, northern coast of Africa, and parts of the Antarctic. The satellite acquires data in four modes, which are the strip map mode, the interferometric white swath mode, the extra white swath mode, and the wave mode. The interferometric white swath mode is the default mode over land areas. And of course, as the name suggests, it is also the mode of choice for interferometric applications and will be used also for today's exercise. The spatial resolution differs by mode and the data are available in three different products with different level of processing. The single look complex data or SLC data are the data of choice for interferometric processing. Then we have the GRD or ground range detected. And finally, the level two data, which is the oceanographic data sets. Now let's finally move to the exercise. So let's start and let's go to the Bruce virtual machine. Now to access the virtual machine, I need to log in. So let me do that. Here we go. And this is the main desktop of the Rus virtual machine. You can see that there is already many tools pre-installed, as I mentioned during the presentation. And let's now have a look at the folder or the exercise folder. So let's go to training. Here is a number of different tutorials, but um, the one that we are interested in is the HAZA09 Snap to Stamps data preparation. And here you will find three folders. We have the AUX data folder, the original folder where we will save all the downloaded original products before processing. And here we have the project folder where we will save all the processed products and conduct all the processing steps. Now, first thing first, we need to download the data. So let's go to Firefox. 
And as you may know, on the Rus virtual machine, it will always by default open on the Copernicus Open Access Hub web page. However, this time we will not be using the Copernicus Open Access Hub for a very simple reason. We are using data from the 1st of November 2019 to the 1st of November of 2020. This means that some of the data or some of the products that we are using are more than a year old. And as you may know, products that are more than a year old are placed in the long-term archive on the um, Copernicus Open Access Hub. Unfortunately, the retrieval of the products from the long-term archive is not very straightforward. You can only request one product at a time, and then you have to wait for it to become available before you can download it, and of course, before you can re also retrieve another product. Since our time series consists of approximately 30 images, or specifically 31 images, this would take a very long time. We will therefore use the Alaska Satellite Facility so let's go there. And the Alaska Satellite Facility holds the entire archive of the Sentinel-1 SLC products. And you can therefore download any products that you would like. Now, it has also more tools than just the simple data find or search and download. It has also, for example, tool for SAR processing. We will not be using that today. Um, API uh, data search and find and then also um, this uh, interferometry baseline tool, which allows you to check your selected mas master and choose appropriate slave images that you want to pair with your master based on the perpendicular and temporal baseline. We will not use either of those. We will just simply use the vertex tool to download our data. So let's go there. And similarly, as in the Copernicus Open Access Hub, you do need to create an account and you do need to log in in order to be able to download the data. So let's go here to the window sign in. And if you do not have an account yet, you need to click here to register and fill in all the necessary information as well as validate and activate, validate your email and activate your account. And once you're done, you can, of course, log in. So let me go back to the login window. And let me do just that. And then I click login. And here we go. Now, as a next step, I, of course, have to zoom in to the area of interest. So that will be Mexico City. And I can also use this tool to move the map around. There we go. And now I can use the box drawing tool to draw my area of interest. You just need to click, then release, and then click again to close the polygon. So there we have the polygon. And now we can go up here where we have the details. So we have, of course, we have search type is geographic. Then we use the Sentinel-1. And we have the area of interest defined already on the map. And now we have to go to the additional filters. And in the additional filters, you have much the same filters as you can find in the Copernicus Open Access Hub. So for example, the start date and end date of the acquisitions that we are searching for. So for the start date, Let's select the 1st of November 2019. For the end date, the 1st of November 2020. Then we choose file type. And we choose the L1 single loop complex. Then we choose direction, which will be descending. And then subtype, which will be Sentinel-1A. So we will only be using the data acquired by Sentinel-1A, not Sentinel-1B in this one. So this search will return quite a few data sets. So let me perform the search. And let me now zoom out. And you can see that I have four different footprints here. So these correspond to routinely acquired products. So of course, each footprint will correspond to multiple different products acquired in the same geometry over time. And we can then have a look 
at the property. So for example, which product here from these four we would want to choose? Because of course, ideally we would only want to have a single product that makes the simplest processing. We would also want to have all our products in the same exact acquisition geometry. So for us, the most sensible product seems this one here. So if I click on it, one of the same products will be highlighted in the list of the results. And here also I get some information. And the important part here is the information here, the path and frame. So the path is actually the same as what you can see as relative orbit in the Copernicus Open Access Hub web page or in portal. So this is the same thing. So you would choose the 143 as an orbit in the Copernicus Open Access Hub to find this product. And let me now click here. And now I can save, set this specific orbit or path, and I can set it as either start path or end path or both. So in my case, since I only want product from this specific path, I have to set as both. Now you can see that in the same path, I have two products. So these are acquired in the same orbit. The satellite over this area acquires continuously, and then the acquisition is basically cut into different frames. So I have two different frames here. One you can see has a number of 531, and the second one, that is the one that I want, has 526. So again, I can specify this frame by going to this arrow here and go to set as both. You can already see that it's updated. And now when I go to filters, you can also see that here, this path and frame filters have been updated accordingly. And this corresponds to 31 files. Now I have the 31 files here. And the next thing that I can do is I just can click here on the add all the results to downloads. Then I have to click again here at add 31 files to downloads. And they have been added here to the downloads tab. Now, if I open the downloads tab, you can see all my files. You can also see that they are all quite large. So you can imagine that if you're working with long time series of SLC products, the processing is going to be quite difficult and time demanding and also very demanding on space on your drive. So for example, this simple pre-processing exercise that we are doing with 31 images, the total size of the exercise or of the data processed is 400 gigabytes. So just to give you an idea of the size. Now we can go to data download. And here we have two options. We have data download by Python script, which basically you can here download the Python script, which you will run in your Python on your machine or computer. And this Python script contains all the information needed to download the data, and it will download the data for you automatically. The next option is the MetaLink or Metadata MetaLink, which is the same as, for example, if you're downloading data from the Copernicus Open Access Hub from the card and you receive the Meta4 file. So we will choose this option because we are already familiar with it. And we save the file. Now I can click here to go to the folder where it has been downloaded. On the Rus Virtual Machines, this is by default the home Rus folder. And you can see the file here. Now the name is quite long, so let me just rename it to make it more simple. And I will rename it to MC underscore desk as descending. And I click on rename. And here I have it. And I right click, I say copy it, and I copy it to my training folder, to my original folder here, where I want to download all the data. So now I'm ready to download the data, and I will use ARIA2 tool for this. You can use different tools that can manage the meta file or meta link file, but ARIA2 is very useful and very simple tool, and it's already pre-installed on the Rust virtual machines. To use ARIA2, you just right-click and you open terminal here. It is important to open the terminal or at least inside the terminal, navigate to the folder where you want to save the downloaded data. So the data will be downloaded to the path that then shows here in the front, which corresponds to the folder from which you opened the terminal. 
And now let me first test if I have ARIA2 installed. So I type to see, and you can see that um, the command has been recognized, although I have not specified any URL, so the command does not have anything to do. So now let's copy paste the command. So here, this is the command that needs to be used to call the ARIA 2C and feed it the MetaLink file in order to be able to download the, uh, the products. So the parts of the command are ARIA 2C. Then we have the dash dash HTTP dash user, which is the username. And then you have the password, of course. Both the password and the username should be enclosed in uh, quote, single quotation marks. Then we have dash dash check certificate and equals false. And then we have dash M, which specifies that we are feeding it the uh, meta or meta link file. And then we, of course, have the name of the file. Since we are already in the folder or running the ARIA 2C in a folder where the file is located, we do not need to provide the entire path. If we were running it in a different folder, we would, of course, need to provide the full path to uh, this file. So now I can just click Enter. And you can see the download has started. However, of course, the download here would take quite a while. So I will not proceed with the download. I already have the data downloaded. And let me just continue with that. So let me block this download. Here we go. And I just close the terminal. And let me just quickly update this folder. And here we go. So now this is my downloaded data. You can see that in the folder there is 32 items, so 31 files plus one metalink. And now let's proceed with the actual processing and preparation of this data set for stamps ingestion. So let me minimize this and close the uh, downloads basket. And now the first thing that we need to do, we actually need to download the Snap to Stamps tool. So let me just go to a next tab and type Snap to Stamps. And the first link here is to the Snap to Stamps repository on GitHub. So let's go there. And we can right away use the download zip here to download the latest version. Okay. And again, here we have the Snap to Stamps Master zip downloaded. So let's go to the folder. Extract here. And now you can go inside. So there is no need to actually install this tool. You can just read the manual here. So you have the manual folder here. And then what you need is these two folders. So I would advise to take these two folders and copy them into your project folder. So let me go back here and I'll go to project and I paste them here. And now we have everything ready to start the processing. So we have the bin with the uh, Python scripts here. And then we have the graphs, which are the graphs created in Snap, and those are then uh, updated and run by the Python scripts. So there's two other things we need to do. Firstly, the Snap to Stamps has been created using Snap version 6, and there's unfortunately some incompatibilities that have not been fixed yet. So let's fix them now manually, and we need to update these two files. So the co-registration IFG computation and the co-registration IFG computation subset. So let's start with the subset. Let's right click and go to open with and open with mouse pad. If you just double click, the XML will automatically open in a browser where it's not editable. And now we need to navigate to this node ID enhanced spectral diversity, which is line 35. And here, unfortunately, the um, supplied shifts have changed from user supplied shifts to user supplied shifts in azimuth and range. So we need to remove this line here on line 49, which is the use supplied shifts, and we delete it. And then we can go to a file that I have prepared for you, which is in the AUX data folder. 
and it's called update underscore b7. And if you open it, you can just simply copy these two lines, take care to copy them also with the space in front. Then you go back to your XML file and paste them. So we have now replaced the used supplied shifts with use supplied range shift and use supplied azimuth shift. So now we just click save and we should repeat the same for the other file. Which was co-registration IFG computation, so without subset. And again, I go to open with mouse pad. I again open it. It will be on the same line. So again, line 49, use, use supplied shifts. I delete it. And I again copy the two lines here, pass them here, and there we go. Click Save. There we go. And now we have completed the change. So this is a little bit confusing, I know. But basically, there are certain parameters that each operator in SNAP recognizes, and it expects them in the uh, graph file. If these are not the same, then of course, we the operator will fail. So this is why we needed to update manually, because this is not yet included in the SNAP to stamps workflow. OK, and now let's close this window, and let's have the first look on the data. Let's minimize also the browser window, and let's open SNAP. Now, many of you will already be familiar with the SNAP interface. So let's just here click no. We do not want to run the update check right now. And here we have the product explorer window or tab. Below we have some other useful tabs such as navigation, color manipulation, and so on. I'll show you what these are for in a little bit. And let's now load the data. So let me click here on open product and navigate to the training folder and to our original data folder. And I can just select all the zip files that I have downloaded. They will not be loaded in order of acquisition time, but that's okay. I don't need to do that right now. The loading will also take a little while, so let's wait. Okay, and here we go. And you, I have 31 images here. And now let's have a look at the first image. In this case, it's from the 18th of November. And let's go to the bands folder and let's open the intensity IW inter interferometric white swath 3 in DV polarization. And here we are. And now when we see the image, you can see that there is these sort of lines. So we always have part, which we call a burst. And we have several of them divided by this black pixels in between. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine bursts in this subswath. Not all the products will have nine bursts. Some of them can have eight. And then here we have navigation. And let's go to the world view. Let's find our images and zoom in. And here you can see, which is quite strange, that not all of our images have exactly the same footprint. So this is not because they have been acquired from a different geometry or a path. So we have these that have the footprint more down, and then we have the ones that are cut here. This is also due to the fact that uh, the frame has has been cut in different location. The definition of frames can change in time, so this is one of the reasons. Now, you remember that the Mexico City have, has been located here in this side, in this very corner, but now here it seems as if the image is mirrored to the other side. So this is due to the fact that the radar instrument on board of Sentinel-1 carries an antenna that is looking always to the right side during its path. Remember, this is a descending path. So the satellite is traveling north to south, and it's looking to the right. So the first data that will be acquired, so subswath 1, that will be here, is this part here. The interferometric white swath uh, mode products are consisting of 
three subswaths, as you can see, three, two, and one. So the first one is here, the second one is in the middle, and the third one is on this side. So that's why we opened the IV3. And then here we have Mexico City, which shows as brighter pixels. Of course, I know it's there, so I can easily see it. And then because Snap shows on the upper left corner the pixel that has been acquired first, then it's this pixel right here, because remember, it's flying like this. So it starts acquiring from this direction. That is also why this image appears to be mirrored left to right. First step that we need to do is to select the master image. For this, we will go to Radar, Interferometric, and Insar Stack Overview. And here we click Add Opened. This will load all the images that we have opened. It's the 31 images that we have downloaded. And then we click Overview. And the operator will analyze all the images. And it will provide us with the suggested optimal master here. And then the information about the slave images, such as perpendicular and templar baseline, and so on. So we have the B perp, which is the perpendicular baseline in regards to the master image. And then we have the B temp which is the temporal baseline, again, with regard to the master image. The master image is selected such that the distribution of the perpendicular baseline values is as low as possible, while still maximizing the expected stack coherence of the interferometric stack. The selection of the optimal master should lead to an improved visual interpretation of the interferograms and assist also the quality assessment and is absolutely necessary for any PSI processing that we want to do. So now we have here the master, and you can see the master image is the one acquired on the 4th of May 2020. Now we don't need to do anything more here, we just close the view, but remember this date here, 4th May 2020. But before we open any product, first let's go back to the original data folder, Let's create a new folder, which is going to be called master. Then let's find our master product, which remember is the one from the 4th of May. And let's move it into the master folder. Just check that is the correct one indeed. Then let's select all the slave products. Let's go to cut and let's paste them into the project folder into a new folder called slaves. Be careful because this folder has to be named exactly as this because it is automatically accessed by the next steps, so by the automated snap to stamps processing. And if you name it any different, it will not be able to find it. It also has to be located in the projects folder. So now we have the slaves folder, which contains 30 items, so the 30 slave products. Now let's go back to snap and open the single master product. We can just quickly see the product and open again the uh, intensity band VB. Here we go. And here we can also see the three bursts that we will be using. So it's burst seven to nine. Remember the descending mode always numbers burst one from the top while the ascending mode will have burst one at the bottom. Now, in the next step, we need to perform the Sentinel-1 TOPS split and apply orbit file on the master product. We will do it in a simple graph. So the graph is already located in the snap to stamps master. So if I just look here, you can see that you have master split and apply orbit. Unfortunately, since the master split and apply orbit graph here has been created in the snap version 6, and it cannot be easily opened in the uh, snap version 7 without errors. In this reason, since it's a very simple graph, we will just quickly recreate it. And it will also give us a basis to understand how the graphs work. So let's go to Graph Builder. You can find it in Tools, Graph Builder. And when you open it, it originally has two operators, read and write. 
in the read, there is automatically loaded the master product here. And then we right click, add, radar, and apply orbit file. So this is how we can simply add a operator into our graph. And we simply drag and connect an arrow from the read operator to the apply orbit operator. You can see that there's also a tab that appeared below, which corresponds to this new operator and all its parameters. The next operator that we need to apply is the split, or topsar split operator. So again, we go to radar and we go to sentinel one tops and topsar split. And we connect both. Now the arrow here under the graph has disappeared. We have a connected graph, which goes from the reading a product to writing an output product. So again, here in the read, there is already the master product loaded because that's the only one that we have loaded into Snap. Then I go to the write tab. Here I will leave the same name. I will just go and navigate to my project folder. So I go to shared training training folder project. And here I will create a new folder named master again, but this time it is located in the project folder. It is really important to put all your processing and all the needed data into the project folder. It does not need to be named project, but it needs to be a single folder that holds all the needed data for the snap to stamps processing. Then we go to the apply orbit operator, which updates the orbit metadata present in the Sentinel-1 file. As these are generally not the most precise orbits that are only available two weeks after the acquisition, but the product as such is available much earlier with less precise orbits. So here we choose the orbit state vectors, the Sentinel precise, which is the most precise type of orbit. And it is, as I said, available only couple of weeks after the acquisition. And next we go to the Topsar split operator tab. And the Topsar split needs to be applied in any interferometric processing. And this is due to the fact that most of the operators that we will be using later can only work with one subswath at a time. You can then merge them later. However, um, the processors do require the split product. Moreover, if you're looking at smaller area, such for example here, we have our entire study area only in one subswath and only in three bursts. So we don't actually need to process the entire subswath, the nine bursts. We only need to process three. So here in the subswath, we choose subswath three. We choose only single polarization. As for interferometric applications, you generally use the VB polarization. And then we choose bursts seven to nine, so these here. And here you can see the final selected area if you zoom in to the product. You can see this is the three birds, bursts that we have selected. This is not very good base map with very high resolution, but you can still sort of see the Mexico City here. And we can now save the graph if we wish to, or we can just simply click run. This process is generally very quick. It is only one product, so it's very quick. It's already done, four seconds. And we can now close the graph window. And we can go to Product Explorer and see that we have new product here. If I open it, you can see we only have one subswath and one polarization. And if I click on the intensity IV3BB, you can see that this contains now only three bursts. And now we can close Snap and proceed with the Snap to Stamps automated processing. I will go back to my training folder and I'll go to project and bin. And here you can find the project.conf file, which is the configuration file for the Snap to Stamps processing. So let me open it by just double clicking. It will open in the mouse pad or in any other text editor that you might have installed. And then here you can see that there's a number of parameters that I need to set in order to process the data automatically. So the first parameter here is the project folder, the graphs folder. Then I have the subswath that I want to select. Then I have the location of my master image, pre-processed master image. Then I have the area of interest. 
So in case the three bursts that I have selected in the uh, split operator are still, the area is still too large, I can apply a further spatial subset here. And I need to provide, of course, the minimum longitude and latitude and maximum longitude and latitude. So it's a bounding box, basically. Then I need to provide a path to the GPT, which is the command line snap interface. And then I need to also provide the specification, how much resources should the process employ. So CPU and the size of the cache. So now let's start with the beginning. Let's start with the projects folder. And the projects folder, of course, corresponds to the project folder that we have saved in our training kit. So let me select the path. There we go. Then the graphs folder, that is this folder that contains the default um, snap to stamps graphs. So again, let me select the path and provide it here. Then you remember we have chosen for the processing or our study area is located in subsworth number three. So I type three. Then I need to provide the location of my pre-processed master image. And we have saved this in the folder named master in the project folder. So let me select this folder, go inside. And here I need to provide the entire path to the pre-processed master product. So let me just select it, then select here and copy paste the entire path. You can see that it includes the path to the folder as well as the name of the header file. And now we arrive to the area uh, of interest box. So how do we get the coordinates for spatial subset? One way you can find the coordinates is simply to go to your browser and navigate to the bounding box app. And here is the bounding box from Clock and Tech. So that one I find very useful. And you can just, just zoom out and then find the location that you wish to create your box over. So city of Mexico. We can put a satellite base map just to be more clear. And now here at the bottom, we will select CSV. Now the CSV provides us coordinates of the box that we will draw in the format of minimum longitude, minimum latitude, maximum longitude, and maximum latitude. Let's now draw the bounding box. So let's select and draw. We should select maybe a bit smaller area. And here we go. So this pretty much covers the center and some surroundings of the city. And here you see my coordinates. So I can copy paste those. And of course, in the proper way, I can copy paste them into the project configuration file. So let me copy paste. Go to the project configuration file. And of course, the minimum longitude. We passed here. Minimum latitude. Then maximum longitude. And minimum latitude and maximum latitude, sorry. Okay, now I can delete what I have here. And now this is how my area of interest is set. Now I can go to the snap GPT where I need to provide the GPT path. And that is generally saved in the file system, USR, local and snap and then bin. And here is the GPT. So let me select it.
and pass it here. Now I have the path to the GPT. And finally, I need to set the computing resources to employ for the SNAP to STEMS processing. We can set the CPU number and the cache size to use here. And it needs to be selected based on the um, virtual machine or a computer that you're using. If you're not sure, you can check the system resources by going to the terminal and just simply typing ls cpu and at the top it will give you the information on how many cpu cpus um, your computer has available or your virtual machine so that is eight for me here and then if you want to find out how much memory or available ram your virtual machine or computer has you just type dash g free test dash g and you have here and then the first column says how much total ram in gigabytes you have available in your in your computer and by rule of thumb generally you want the process to use maximum between 70 and 80 percent of the available memory so for example this virtual machine is stronger than the general rus machine which generally has about 15 gigabytes of ram where i would select for example 12 However, for this machine, I would select then eight CPUs and approximately 20 gigabytes of RAM to be used. So this is my settings for the uh, project configuration file. I can now save it. And we are now ready to use this configuration file for the automated processing of the slaves and the interferograms. So let me close it. Let me also minimize the browser. The first step is to divide the slave images into folders with name corresponding to the acquisition date in the format of year, month and day. This is necessary first step for enabling the automated processing. So let's start with it. You remember now our slaves are just um, in a single folder called slaves. So let's now go to the bin folder where the automated processing scripts are placed. Right click, go to open terminal here. And now again, the terminal opens in this path and we can call the script, which is called slavesprep.py. So this is a Python script, which will divide the slaves into um, the named folders, as I mentioned. And remember that uh, snap to stamps requires Python 2 to be run. This can be problematic if your default Python is version 3 and it may create problems. So first we need to check what our default Python version is. So let's just type Python. And you can see that indeed for me here on the Rus virtual machine, the default Python is 3.7 version. So this would not work. So let's go. Let's exit the Python. But fortunately, we also have Python version 2 installed, and I can call it by typing Python 2. And you can see that now the version that this call refers to is 2.7. And this version is then compatible with snap to stamps We just have to adjust the command accordingly. Note, however, that the commands to call Python might be different on your computer or operational system. And it also depends, of course, if you have the Python 2.7 installed, which is necessary for running snap to stamps or if you're using, for example, Anaconda environments. I will, however, not go into the specific setup here. So let's exit Python again. And now I can call the slavespreparation.py or slavesprep.py. So I will type Python 2, then the name of the file. So let me move the, here so you can see both. So here, this is the script I'm calling. So I have Python 2 slaves prep pi. And then the input to this script is the configuration file we have set up in a previous step. So I write project.conf, which is the name of that file. And you can see it here. 
And now I can simply click Run. You see that this part of the processing is very quick. It's already done. And now if I go back to the project folder and I go to slaves, you can see that now my slave images are divided two folders by name. Each folder um, includes a single product and the folder is named based on the acquisition date of the product. The next step is to proceed with the apply orbit and topsar split of the slave images. So we need to pre-process them the same way as we have pre-processed the master image. But luckily in this way, we do not have to do it in the graphical interface anymore. And we can use the uh, prepared graph, which is saved again in the graphs folder. And it's here, slave split and apply orbit.xml here. And we can call it by the splitting slaves.py script which is again saved in the bin. So let's now go back to our terminal and type again Python 2 and then splitting, sorry, slaves.py. And again, I need to provide the configuration file, which is So project.conf. Sorry. There we go. So this process takes approximately one minute per slave, so slightly longer than it did in the graphical interface for the master image. And so it is approximately 30 minutes for 30 images for this VM. For this reason, I will not run now the steps here because, of course, it would not uh, be ideal for us to wait for 30 minutes. So let me just show you how the result will look. Once the script is finished, we could go back to the project folder and a new folder called split would appear here. If you open it, you have the same as you have in the slaves folder. So folders named by the acquisition date of the slave image. But if you click inside, you now have a, a dim format product with the name of acquisition date and then the subswath name, which contains splitted product for which the orbits have been updated. So now this image or this slave and also all the others are ready for the next step, which is the master slave core registration and interfer interferogram generation step. For this step, again, we will go to the bin and what is used is this core registration IFG topsar Pi. So this step takes care of the co-registration of each master and slave image and calculating or, or creating the interferogram as well as a couple other steps. So let's have a look how the graph looks. If you go to graphs, there is the correct IFG computation or correct IFG computation, computation with a subset. So you remember we have set a subset bounding box for our study area. So in our processing, this version of the code will be used where in addition to the co-registration, interferogram generation and other steps, also a spatial subset will be performed. If we did not set any spatial subset into the configuration file, then this graph would be used. So let's just quickly open the graph here to see how it looks. So let's load the graph. So I will go and I will load this correct IFG computation. I will not load the one with subset because as I have mentioned previously, some graphs are not possible to be opened in the new version. And that is the case for this one. So let me just open the one without the subset. And now let's go step by step. So the first operator here is the back geocoding and it is connected to two read operators for a master and a slave product and the back geocoding co-registers two Sentinel-1 SLC split products, master and slave, of the same subswath using the orbits of the two products and a digital elevation model. Then we have this enhanced spectral diversity operator, which follows the Sentinel-1 back geocoding operator in the TOPS INSAR processing chain, and it basically estimates the final constant range offset for the whole subswath. Then we have the interferogram which computes the complex interferogram with subtraction of the flat earth or reference phase. 
it can also be run without, and the flat earth phase is the phase that is present in the interferometric signal due to the curvature of the reference surface. Then we have the top the burst, and we know that each subswath image consists of series of bursts, where each burst has been processed as separate LS SLC image, and the individually focused complex burst images are included in the azimuth order in a single subswath image with a black fill demarcation in between. So you have seen these black lines that divide the, uh, the image between the bursts. And this processor merges the bursts into a continuous image based on their zero Doppler time and removes the demarcation pixels. Then we have the topographic phase removal tool, which estimates and subtracts the topographic phase from the interferogram. And finally, we have the write operator, which writes the output. You can see that we have sort of two lines here. So in this path, the interferogram is um, exported. And here, only the co-registered complex images are exported. So let's now go back. And let's run this script, or at least um, show how the script would be run. So again, it would be Python 2, then the name of the script. So let me navigate back to the bin folder. And the script is the correct IFG topsar.py. So and again, I have to pro provide the project file. project.conf. Now this step is extremely time demanding and it will be approximately 15 minutes per slave image. And remember, we are only working with three bursts and it's still 15 minutes, which means that for 30 images, that is approximately uh, seven hours and 30 minutes. So again, it makes no sense to be run now during this webinar. And let me show you how the results will look. Now, if I would have run the process and it would have finished, I would go back to the project folder and I would find two new folders. One would be called IFG, where the interferogram output is saved. And the other one would be called co-registration, where the co-registered product is saved. Now, this is the one step before the last of the snap to stamps workflow. And at this point, we need to check all the interferograms. So we need to make sure that no empty interferograms have been created, or this will create problems later on. Specifically, it would create problems with the amplitude dispersion uh, index estimation, which serves then for the selection of the pixels suitable for the PSI analysis. So let's now go back to SNAP. And let's open all the interferogram images. Luckily, they are not in single folders anymore, so I can just select all and click open. And now when all the images are open, we can just go one by one and open the face IFG band for each product. And we can check that each of them the all, that all the interferograms are populated and correctly generated. I will not show all the interferograms here. I will just show the first one. So for example, this one is an interferogram with the master, of course, uh, the 4th of May, 2020. And the slave is from the 6th of November, 2019. So there's approximately six months in between them. And we can already see the fringes forming here where we expect the center of the city to be. And we can actually see them in the interferogram, even in the unfiltered infer interferogram already. Now, the last step of the automated workflow from SNAP to STAMPS is the STAMPS export. So the STAMPS export tool is included in SNAP already since a couple of years back. And you can find it when you go to interferometric and PSI SBAS. So here you have stamps export. But again, since we need to export our 30 co-registered images and interferograms, we will not use this single tool here. And instead, we will use the script already prepared in the workflow. So let's me minim let me minimize the window here. 
and let's go back to bin and it will be the stamps export dot pi here if i open the corresponding graph then i go to graph builder again load and then here i have the export dot xml and you can see it's read two read operators for the interferogram and for the co-registered product and then stamps export so let me close and if I go back to the bin file and to the terminal, I will use again the same call. So let me just go backwards here. And I use Python 2 and underscore export.py. And I would again click run. So it's Python 2 stamps export.py project here project.conf of course and i would click run and i would um, have the products exported again this step is quite time demanding and requires about 12 minutes per image or per product which then comes for 30 products to approximately six hours so again i will not show it here but i will show you how the result will look so let's go back to the project folder and if we have run the process we would now have as i have here this insar folder which is called insar underscore 2020 which is then the acquisition date of the master and if i open it i have four folders there which are the dem diff zero geo and rslc and this is the input into the stamps processing um, in the gamma format now, the last step that I will show you during this exercise is actually the first step of the stamps processing, and it is no longer part of the snap to stamps processing. So this folder here with, with the data, so the insar folder here with these four folders inside and the data here, this is the input that you can feed into stamps for further PSI processing. Now, the first step of the stamps processing does not actually require MATLAB to be installed, so we can perform it even on this machine, and therefore I can show it to you as well. I have, of course, stamps installed with all its corresponding packages and uh, dependencies. So the final step before we ingest the data to stamps for PSI processing is the estimation of the amplitude dispersion index. So the DA is a value that describes the amplitude stability, which is then used to pre-select the pixels and therefore reduces the number of pixels for the phase analysis. Generally, the recommended range for DA is uh, 0 0.4 to 0 0.42. The higher the threshold, the more pixels will be then selected for phase analysis and the longer it will take. Note that surfaces like water and vegetation where amplitude is unstable will exhibit higher DA values than, for example, bedrock or man-made structures that are most likely to be PS pixel candidates. As mentioned before, this script is included in stamps but does not actually require MATLAB license. So to run the script, let me just open a clean terminal. I will open terminal here in the insar folder, so the new folder that we have created with the stamps export, and I will click open terminal here. And the script is called mt prep snap, so And since my stamps is installed, I can directly just call this script. So first let's call it without any parameters provided. And here it will tell us what the usage is. So the usage basically is the empty prep snap. Then we provide the master date. Then we provide the path to the insar underscore 2020.0504 directory. And then we provide the DA threshold. So remember, I was saying that standardly the threshold is approximately 0 0.4 to 0 0.42. Here um, it's mentioned that it's 0 0.4 for PS and 0 0.6 for small baselines method. And then we can also choose the number of patches in range, the number of patches in azimuth, 
This setting is mostly for large study areas where we want to divide the study area into smaller patches for more effective processing and then overlapping pixels between the patches. So these four last parameters are optional and you do not need to select them. If you do not select the number of patches, by default, the entire area or the entire study area that you have will be processed as a single patch. Okay, so now let's call the script. So it will be empty prep snap, then 2020 0504. And then I need the link to this folder. So I can simply drag it into my terminal. Here I have it. And then I will choose threshold of 04. I will not set any other parameters. My study area is small enough to be processed in a single patch. However, for example, if the resources of your computer are not as high, you will want to, for example, put two by two patches, so four patches in total or similar number in order to make the processing more digestible by your PC. And now I would click enter. Again, this processing is relatively long, as always it seems to be in this exercise. It does not take nearly uh, as long as the last two steps that we have done. So the co-registration is most definitely the longest step in the processing. And of course, also the stamps export takes a while, um, but still this step takes approximately hour. So if we would have run this step, then in our INSAR folder, a new files would appear. So if I click here, you see that a new folder called patch one, so the single patch that we processed here, and then number of other files have appeared. Now these and this entire folder is now ready to be ingested by uh, MATLAB to stamps. And you can proceed if you have MATLAB license into PSI processing. I will not go into the specifics of PSI processing here in this webinar, as it would give for another very long session. But hopefully you can look forward to training session or a webinar on PSI processing sometimes during next year. Now, this is the end of this exercise session. I hope you have enjoyed it and I hope that the information was useful to you. I realized that uh, unlike for the other webinar sessions that we usually have, here we do not have any visualized output. We only have a folder that is then ready for future processing and we do not have the final product available in this webinar. But still, I hope that it was useful to see how the pre-processing using the snap to stamps toolbox works and how to prepare the data for the ingestions to stamps. For stamps and snap to stamps as well, there is quite a lot of resources available online. I would recommend, for example, the GIS blog, as I've mentioned already during the presentation, which gives the exact steps to follow for PSI processing. Now, let me close the virtual machine and move back to the presentation for your questions. If you have not posted any questions yet, please do so now and I will connect back in a couple seconds when I read through them.